This episode is sponsored by Card Kingdom. Go to cardkingdom.com slash studies and assemble some gifts for those near and dear to you. This episode is sponsored by NordVPN. Using a virtual private network is like putting card sleeves on your internet signal, and Nord provides a high-quality, user-friendly product that encrypts your personal data to block malware and potential cyber attacks. Connect to over 5,200 servers in 60 countries with one click, then change your location to purchase games or access streaming services that are unavailable in your hometown. One subscription keeps six devices safe across all platforms. I use Nord on my MacBook on public Wi-Fi, on my Windows desktop at home, and on my phone for all the places in between. I'm excited about this partnership because I believe in the value of cybersecurity, and the added utility and speed that Nord offers makes this a smart investment going into the new year. This holiday season, give the gift of digital security at nordvpn.com slash studies. Use coupon code RISTICSTUDIES to get a two-year plan plus one additional month for less than the price of a booster box. Secure your connection with NordVPN. Wow, he's racing. I think I like that play. He's calculated how quickly Frank Karsten can cast Rending Vines, and he can stay ahead of him with those forms of the dragon. The scary part is we know Karsten has Goryeo's Vengeance in his hand and Yosei in his hand. There's no dragons in his graveyard, though. It's December 2005. Shuffling through the earbuds of your iPod Nano is an ensemble of new music acquired straight from the iTunes store. The timeless bass line of Gorilla's Feel Good Inc., System of a Down's dual-disc effort in Hypnotize Mesmerize, and the breakout record from a small emo punk band from Wilmette, Illinois, who catapulted to the top of the scene overnight and became the heartthrob of every teen girl in the nation. The anthemic hit single of this album reminds you of your crush, but you're too shy to tell her. Sixteen years later, this will still be true. The money you've scraped together working as a busboy at CC's Pizza is just enough to afford some small gifts here and there, but high school occupies all your time and so you rely on Christmas for the goods that live just beyond your part-time minimum wage budget. The only item on your list this year hit store shelves a week prior, and even though there's no chance mom could get her hands on one, a dash of childlike hope has you longing for the morning of the 25th. Perfect Dark has never looked more fun. Meanwhile, across the Pacific, in a convention hall just south of Tokyo, Frank Karsten of the Netherlands is solidifying his future ballot to the Magic Hall of Fame by preparing some gifts of his own. It's December 2005, the semifinals of the World Championships, Yokohama, Japan. So Karsten can play Yosei, then he takes five, then he gets Yosei confiscated. Oh, he's got a Yosei in hand. But it'll get confiscated. It's not hasty. He needs it in his graveyard is where he needs it, but he doesn't have time. After some thoughts and with a smile, uh-huh. Karsten finds his line. <laughs> what follows is a masterful display of sequencing, a snapshot of the technical intricacies that defines the highest levels of tournament magic in 2005. At the crux of this line is an innocuous blue instance that has just been reclaimed to the top of Karsten's deck. Departing from here, Armed with some clever knowledge of the rules and to the thrilling surprise of Brian David Marshall and Randy Bueller in the commentary booth, Karsten puts on a spectacle. Oh wow, he gifts for two cards! That's, that is magical. He gifted for two cards so the dragons would go into his graveyard! Wow! I didn't even know you could do that! Uh, that is That's fantastic. awesome! As seen in the preview article titled Gifts Wrapped, written in September 2004, one year before Yokohama, Gifts Ungiven drew immediate comparison to two cards. The first was Factor Fiction, which also creates a mini-game of decisions for your opponent but reveals five cards instead of four. Reaching the power level of Factor Fiction is a high bar to clear, and franchise players will remember its reputation and its associating acronym. The second card of comparison was Intuition, nicknamed the Blue Demonic Tutor. Gifts Ungiven, according to game designer Mark Gottlieb and author of this piece, 
carves out an interesting little niche right in between. Preview articles like these are always a delight to read in retrospect. In them, we are reminded of how difficult it is to evaluate card strength in a vacuum. In context, Gifts Ungiven quickly proved its worth as a standalone game piece, a card with no analog. Within a year following its printing, the 4-mana instant appeared in winning deck lists across all formats. Steven Menendian sung its praises in Vintage, Masashi Oiso took it to Top 8 in back-to-back -back Grands Prix in Kamigawa Block Constructed, and Frank Karsten's Greater Gifts deck, a masterpiece of his own design, had him on the cusp of the finals of the World Championship in Standard. Standing in his way, however, was Akira Asahara, a titan of Japanese magic, who had just cast the marquee card of his deck, backed up by a toolbox of enchantments to fetch with it. But the story is always better told when you're the one who lived it. Enter Frank Karsten. My name is Frank Karsten. Uh, I started playing around Tempest, which means that I've been playing magic for uh, almost 25 years now. And in that time, I've had several top finishes at, uh, at Pro Tours. I've had the honor of being inducted into the Hall of Fame. Uh, I've done event coverage for Wizards of the Coast, and I've also written a lot of strategy articles where I have used my, my mathematical background to run the numbers on, uh, on mana bases, analyze metagames, apply bits of probability and game theory, and so on. And now, we resolve Enduring Ideal. To provide some kind of context, the, the tournament was the 2005 World Championship in Yokohama, Japan. And this clip is from the, the semifinals, where, in case anyone was wondering, we were asked to play without sleeves to avoid glare on, on the camera. That's just how it was done back in those days. Um, now, I, I would say that I was uh, like on top of my game at that time, and I had gone undefeated in standard with uh, a deck of my own design called uh, Greater Gifts. Now, this deck was basically a control combo deck whose ultimate game plan was to get a greater good onto the battlefield and then sacrifice Yose the Morning Star. Now, that would then lock my opponent out of their next untap step, provide some fresh cards for me in the process, and every turn after that, I would either cast or sacrifice another Yose um, or return on from the graveyard to basically put my opponent into an untap lock, prevent them from ever untapping. And our Gorio's Vengeance was a big part of that whole plan, and Gifts Ungiven was essential in setting it all up. We enter the game in media res, just as Asahara is resolving Enduring Ideal. The clip is from Game 5, the deciding game. Asahara had to cast Enduring Ideal, to which I already responded with Gifts Ungiven, because otherwise he might fetch Ivory Mask, in the end, he chooses to fetch Form of the Dragon, his, his win condition right away. So once that's there, my game plan is to get a 5-5 dragon into the graveyard. And note, I cannot just cast a dragon, because Asahara has Enduring Ideal going, so he would just get Confiscate and, and gain control of them. I just have to get it into the graveyard some other way. I saw another line that worked just as well, and that I had done many times in the past. Uh, I cast Reclaim to bring back Gifts and Given and search for just two dragons. I search for two cards. Oh wow, he gifts for two cards. That's, that is masterful. He gifted for two cards so the dragons would go into his graveyard. Wow. This is the key moment. Despite reading Search Your Library for four cards, Karsten overrides this prerequisite with an understanding of the nuances of searching. And to better explain, I called my friend the pocket judge, Max Kahn. One of the more nuanced rules is the stated quality rule. This basically says that if there's a certain quality of a card that you're searching for, like a certain color or a certain converted mana cost, you aren't required to find a card that matches that quality. Imagine a scenario where you crack an Evolving Wilds and then you realize you don't have any basic lands left in your deck to find. What would you do? Would you give your deck to a judge and have them make sure there's no basics left? Or give it to your opponent and have them make sure there's no basics left? This rule helps us to avoid these nitty-gritty questions by just saying we can fail to find. I mean, admitting that you fail to find is kind of a magic rite of passage. The stated quality rule applies to Gifts Ungiven. So if you're asked to search your library for four cards with different names, you can search for just two and then fail to find the other two cards. This is the loophole. From a rules perspective, Karsten was allowed to find two cards and fail to find the other two. 
even though the original printing of Gifts Ungiven said to search for four cards. The gifts for two meant that the dragons uh, headed to the graveyard uh, and already had multiple black sources on the battlefield. So the only out Asahara had was to get Zur's Weirding and hope that I had not already drawn Goryeo's Vengeance. But as it turned out, Zur's Weirding uh, forces both players to reveal their hands. Uh, I had to show him that I had it and yeah, he saw it and uh, conceded and congratulated me on uh, making it to the finals. There it is, Goryeo's Vengeance. Frank Carson wins! Frank Carson wins. to the finals, congratulations wow. Frank. Great magic, enduring ideal resolved, and it was not good enough. So to recap, Karsten shows up to the World Championships in 2005 with a deck of his own design. He dominates the field all the way to the semifinals. Then in the deciding match, and because he understands so thoroughly the rules that allow him to search for fewer cards than is seemingly required, he finds a line that sneaks just beneath an active form of the dragon and an ongoing enduring ideal. With Goryo's vengeance in hand, he knows a reanimated Yosei with haste is enough to kill Asahara in one swing, which would nullify a possible confiscate, Asahara's strongest out. Finally, since Form of the Dragon states that creatures without flying can't attack Asahara, Karsten's extremely narrow path to victory required finding exactly two dragons with exactly two different names. All this was possible not because of fact or fiction or intuition, but that beautiful niche carved right in between. Since this wonderful moment in 2005, Gifts Ungiven has thrived in eternal formats and continues to reward unorthodox deck building. In 2009, the mad scientist himself brought a Highlander deck to the World Championships in Extended, a bucket list item he had contemplated since Gifts Ungiven was printed. Frank, you're, you're playing a Highlander deck in Extended. What's going on? Karsten told me he didn't do so well in the tournament, but he had a blast piloting the monstrosity. Two years later in 2011, Gifts Ungiven showed up again on the list of cards to watch at Pro Tour Philadelphia, the debut tournament of the newly minted modern format. Players were very excited when the modern format was first announced about being able to play with Gifts Ungiven. Gifts wouldn't find its true home in modern, however, until the end of the decade by slotting perfectly alongside Past in Flames and Goblin Electromancer in the Blue Red Storm Shell. Carmen Handy's guide here from 2017 provides an in-depth analysis of all the iterations that this archetype presented, making it one of the hardest decks to pilot because of its many branching derivations. Of course, the running joke is that the simplest two-card combo to ungive is unburial rites and a game-ending creature like Elish Norn. In practice, though, the card presents a higher ceiling of decision-making than simply fetching a pair of silver bullets. In fact, it's so complex that Gifts Ungiven has become Frank Karsten's favorite magic card of all time. So, I've had my best results and, and great memories with Gifts Ungiven, that, that definitely helps. But I also love the card by itself for, for two main reasons. First, uh, well, Gifts and Given promotes creative deck building with a lot of one-offs to really maximize the card, which makes it so that every game tends to play out differently and you see different interactions every time. And I just enjoy that diversity. I know EDH players can relate to this sentiment. Before you place your orders, though, Gifts Ungiven is banned in the format. Secondly, Gifts Ungiven essentially offers a, a one-card sequential mini-game where both players have to make pretty complicated decisions. Gifts Ungiven forces you to make really complicated decisions, followed by the opponent who also has to make uh, complicated decisions. Yeah, there are few cards in Magic that uh, like offer such such a mini game as Gibson Given. Frank Karsten was inducted into the Magic Hall of Fame in 2009. Since then, he's continued to excel in and out of the tournament halls. Before concluding our interview, I invited him to wax poetic with me about his favorite card. For for quite a while, uh, I felt that the the gifts and given mirror from a Kamigawa block constructed was one of the most skill-intensive matchups that existed and I, I loved playing it. So uh, for quite a while I said, well, uh, you can always uh, wake me in the middle of the night for a, a Gibson Given Mirror match. 
actually don't wake me in the middle of the night when I'm sleeping. But, but if you do, then at least bring two gift stacks to at least make up for it. It's essentially uh, like the whole game of, uh, of magic within just one, uh, one package, within one card. I'm not sure if Gibson Given inspired me to do a PhD in, in game theory and stochastic processes, but you know, it, it also certainly didn't pull me away from it. This episode was sponsored by Card Kingdom and NordVPN. Find the links below to support the show and set yourself up for the new year. To listen to the full interview with Frank Karsten and to support my work directly, head to my Patreon page. I've been making some big moves behind the scenes to further reward my patrons and reinforce that platform, so now's the perfect time to join the team. One dollar per month is a vote of confidence. Anything more comes with perks. Next year is going to be pivotal for the channel, and I couldn't be more excited for what's coming down the pipeline. So if you've enjoyed this year since the call time video, well, know that we're just getting started. Okay, thanks for watching as always. Happy New Year.